So it's amazing all the things that have been going on in our life and in the church world. And uh, uh, you see how the Lord has been touching our, our body and uh, bringing people to a right place, a right understanding. Uh, do you remember the message I preached some time ago called the revival of consecration? That uh, that's what the Lord is doing. He's reviving us. There's a revival taking place in people's lives, but it's a revival of consecration. And that's what's needed, to become consecrated unto the Lord. There's an understanding that a person needs to come to a place where they're under heavy conviction and come to a place of conviction, of where they come and can be convinced of the truth and they're broken down and they're, they find that there's a need in their life and they're squeezed and, the, and that has to happen. But thank God he doesn't leave us there, yes? But conviction is absolutely necessary to squeeze and to, and to bring you to that place where you're convinced of the truth and, you're, and you know there's something missing. And, and then there's conversion. Conversion is where all of a sudden you realize that and you come to that new, you come out of the old and into the new, absolutely necessary. But the, ne but the next step is to not just be converted and say, oh, well, I, I had an encounter with the Lord, I'm converted, I'm born again, and stay there. And how many people today are weak? And how many people today are operating in, in a, a, lame, a lame thinking? Because they're staying in that state of just, I, well, I was converted. Well, great. But there's the consecrated life is what God is after. The life that is consecrated, fully dedicated followers of Jesus Christ. That's what, this all, that's what this church has to be all about. Now, I'm not to the lesson plan yet. I just want to make sure I get this across. <laughs> so, that it's highly important to realize and say, well, uh, you know, Colin, when you finally graduate from college and you get married and you have five children, that's the time to become consecrated. Nope, we're, we're working right now, yes? Right now. Oh, I'm sorry. I meant seven kids. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, and someday you're going to look back and say, where was that sermon that pastor said that? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> but there's a lot of things going on in church world today that aren't healthy. Does everybody know that? And especially at this time frame where we have what was called the holiday of Halloween, where we find many people in, in church world giving themselves to foolishness and calling it spiritual, calling it, calling it love, calling it holiness, calling it wonderful, calling it like we just love one another and get along. And, and I'm telling you it's unhealthy. And we're talking about the deceitfulness of sin. They actually think they're doing right. They actually think they're doing ministry. They actually think that people come into church and are acting this way, that this is a good thing. When it has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit, there's nothing holy about this. And yet he's called pastor. It's a mockery. Okay, thank you, Adam. It's coming to this place of understanding why are we here tonight? Why is it important to know the truth? Why is it important to confront? Why is it important to point out evil? Why is it important to show, like, that's fleshly, that's fleshly thinking, that's bad thinking. Why is it important to bring your children and to train them in the ways of truth? Because do you know where this goes? Do you know where this goes? When you allow fleshly thinking, self-life, when you just start appeasing the people, pleasing the people, when you just start, where, where does it go? This is where it goes. It starts becoming where, where what's the lowest point I can get to that people are, are happy with coming to our church. Do you know where the lowest goes? That's not the lowest, it goes lower. Where you just start trying to get and please and appease people without having an idea of revival, of consecration. The whole world is under the sway of the devil, Bible says. Every, every, every selfish heart, every, all hearts of the human nature are desperately wicked. Does not scripture say that? Desperately wicked, continuous wicked all the time, evil all the time, evil mind. So therefore there's only one escape, you need the divine nature. There's only one hope, you need the divine nature. You need the Holy Spirit nature, you need the Holy Spirit to understand what it is. He says in the latter days, Second Timothy, in the latter days they'll be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of the truth. Well, you and I must come, it says they're going to be greatly deceived, they'll be deceived. Because they do not have a love for the truth. It only is a love for the truth. Where and not just know the truth. What is it? Love. love the truth. It's not just know the truth. Oh, I know the scriptures and I know the theology and I know the scriptures and I know what. No, it's not just knowing the Bible. It's not just knowing the verses. It's not just having the theological terms. It's not just I have to have the answers. It is I have a love for the truth. I give my life to it. It owns me. Truth must own you. That you, you're possessed by truth. You love truth. You know the truth. And truth is 
Jesus, the Savior, Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, I'm going to send you the spirit of truth. You're going to be sanctified by truth. It is all about truth, and in truth, can you have partial truth and still be truth? Can you have a fraction of the truth? Can, you've got to have the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. It is coming to understand that I want to know and live and be possessed by what is true. That it owns me. That's why the Bible says, Proverbs 23, 23, buy the truth and sell it not. Don't give, your, don't give it away. Don't sell it away. Don't sell yourself short. Don't give your years to the cruel one, the Bible says, Proverbs. The cruel one is out to steal your years. So tonight when we're going into this lesson plan, let us go in understanding as we read this, the deceitfulness of sin and what it takes place in all that is going on here in this section of scripture. It says in, in chapter 3, verse 13, as we ended last month, but exhort one another daily while it is called today. Today is called today. Tomorrow is called today. The life on this earth is called today. Because there is a day that's coming when there are no more days. Today, he's calling for you, brethren, you church, to encourage one another. How often? Daily. Exhort. Build up. Build up one another. Exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you, what's the word? Be hardened. How can a person get hardened? Through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin deceives. Comes to that place where you're deceived. You think it's right. It sounds right. You want it. Your affections rule your heart. Your dictates of your own heart, the imaginations of your own mind, the imaginations of your own heart come to the surface and you speak as though you're right and you demand and you could be absolutely full of pride and you had a conversion with the Lord and yet you had that deceitfulness of sin, I want what I want, when I want it and I want it now and after it and you, it's driving you and you want it and the affections and, and you make cases for it and you justify yourself and you explain and you find people who are willing to listen to you so that you can expound on things and tell them and gain support why? because you're all what? I want what I want and it's deceitfulness of sin I want what I want, it's self rule, self will at play I refuse to give up Egypt, I refuse to give up Isaac I refuse to give up this self rule and self will and I'm going to find my way, navigate my way like a serpent without a backbone speaking with a double tongue to get what I want and it will, what will it do to you? harden your heart it'll harden your heart you become obtuse you become insensitive obtuse. You become insensitive. You become calloused. I've been doing some raking and yard work before I leave for Africa and doing with a rake and doing with all this and what ends up having on your hands? I know blisters but what's it? Yeah. Bl calluses and as you've heard me say in time past calluses you can hit calluses do things and you, you, you can prick them and just, you have a, is a insensitivity there in the callus. Well you have a callus on your heart. It becomes calloused like anybody who works with wood, like I know several people here, you work with wood, Scott works with Todd and, and Andrew, you work with, with Dan, you work with wood, and as you work with it, your hands get tougher, and all of a sudden you can slide your hand along a board, and, you, and it doesn't affect you, your hand just goes right across it. I put my hand across the board. If there's one little splinter that's available, it's gone, I'm going to find it. The, my, my typing hands aren't calloused, so that it finds I'm sensitive to it, but somebody who has, who's used to that, well, deceitfulness of sin calluses your heart. Well, you become hardened to it. You're no longer sensitive to it. Saying, well, I don't get what the pastor's saying. What's the problem? That you become calloused. That all of a sudden you start justifying and making that. I don't understand what the pastor, I don't know what he's, I guess he's saying something. I don't know what he's doing. What? That should be telling you something. There's a hardened, there's a callous there. You become obtuse to it. Or it goes into the realm of, I don't care what he says, I, I'm going to do this instead. There's the other problem. It's gone now even to the next step. The deceitfulness of sin has got you. And the Bible is warning, the Holy Spirit is warning. In the book of Hebrews, he's warning us. Remember, he said, no, neglect so great a salvation. 
you start neglecting things. You start neglecting the Holy Spirit. You start neglecting His concerns. You start neglecting His character. You start neglecting His conduct. You start neglecting, encouraging, and exhorting one another in the faith. And instead, life becomes all about... All about... And how you're treating... Me. And it becomes... And all of a sudden, it's, you know, well, a lot of churches, we can go to any church, and we, we can do it. You know, I don't have to read my Bible today, and, and just read, yeah, I've got to read Psalms, I've got to read a Psalm, I read a Psalm a day! I read a Psalm a day, every day I read my Psalms, I go through and I read the Psalms, and it just becomes something you do to now be just, to be spiritual, but you get nothing out of it. It doesn't change your heart in any way. You become hardened to another person's needs, hardened to another person's uh, spiritual growth, hardened to sin. You become hardened to sin. It no longer is something you flee from. You now kind of entertain it because it's something you want. And he's warning them. And now he goes on to verse 14. And he says, For we have become partakers of Christ. What's the next word? If. If. We have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Steadfast, immovable, planted. Not going to be changed, not going to be moved, not in a state of flux. Just as Abraham and his faith in Romans chapter 4, unwavering in our faith. Unwavering. Partakers of Christ. Think of that word partakers. Partakers of Christ in his fellowship. Communion with Christ, in fellowship with Him. Communion with Christ, that even where the one you cannot see, you are in communion with Him now, and in communion with His body. You're partaking of who He is. For we become partakers of Christ, not necessarily just something He did, but partakers of who He is. You have become partakers, participant, part of, alongside, not just something he has done, but who he is. You now have Christ in you, the hope of glory. And as you look at this idea of partaking, you realize that when he submitted and said nevertheless, and submitted, then what does he want you and I to do? Submit and have the nevertheless, full surrender. When he all of a sudden says, these are my sufferings, what does he want for you and I to do? Suffer fellowship of his sufferings. The fellowship, the Bible says, the fellowship of his sufferings. Having that nevertheless working in your life. The fellowship of his sufferings. That as he was rejected, no, you're excused because he was rejected, you're excused from it. What does he say? No. Matter of fact, you're going to be part fellowship with it, participate with it. As you, as you reject the world, the world has nothing in me and I have nothing in the world, he said, what does he want for you? The same. So you're going to suffer in the flesh. The Bible says in 1 Peter, says that, therefore, since we suffer in the flesh, that's what he says, therefore, since we, what does he say? Not if we, since we suffer in the flesh, he says, let us arm ourselves with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. What's it say? He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. What's it say? Deceitfulness of sin. How do I stop this? Suffer in the flesh. What? Deny yourself. Deny your fleshly affections. Deny your fleshly rule. Deny your fleshly will. Deny your fleshly thinking. One of the biggest problems is that people say, I know the Holy Spirit, but they don't know who they are in the, in the natural man. Kara brought that to my attention last night. We were chatting and she goes, it seems like the people in Africa, they, they want things and they understand things like spiritual. They have a spirit, but they don't know the natural man's danger. They don't know what natural man looks like. They, so that's a great point, Kara. That's exactly right. And not only that, but it's in the church world today. That people don't really understand the danger of their natural man. They don't understand the danger of their own nature. They don't understand the danger, the evilness that dwells in our own heart. And the way we manipulate and maneuver to get things to come our own way. They, we don't see it or we don't want to see it. And deceitfulness of sin gets a hold of us. So Peter wrote and said, Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourself with the same mind. And he's given you the Holy Spirit, just as the same Holy Spirit does with, with him, not only was with him, but is now with you and in you. And he wants you to do the same thing. By the Spirit, arm yourself with the same mind, because you're going to suffer in the flesh 
because you're partakers of Christ. Well, you can't partake of Christ if you don't partake of his sufferings. You can't partake of Christ if you accept his surrender and his nevertheless and his not my will, Father, but yours. Then that has to be you too. It's called dying to self. This is the great battle. The great battle is not between you and the devil. The great battle is you denying yourself. This is the battle that's going on in the church world today. They don't want to deny themselves. People do not want to deny. They make a case for themselves. They manipulate. They maneuver. They navigate. And they're talking with double standards, double tongue, double mind, double heart, trying to satisfy, appease, and please, and try to get things to go well for. I want, I, well, I don't want to offend, and I don't want this, I want to make sure, and I want to make sure my daughter still, I want to make sure my son still, I want to make sure my dad still, and, it's, and so they're constantly stirring the flesh nature. Their own affections are restricting them. But it all goes away when you die to yourself. It's amazing how many problems go away when you deny yourself. When you die to self and you fully surrender, it's amazing how many problems actually go away. Because most problems are self-imposed. Most problems are a refusal to surrender. I know what the pastor said. I know what the Word of God says, but it seems to me. And then start telling everybody how wonderful you actually are. Deceitfulness of sin. The Bible says that whatever is not from faith is sin. The deceitfulness of sin. The deceitfulness of unbelief. The deceitfulness of not following after the Word of God. The deceitfulness of following our own ways, our own word, our deceitfulness of doing our own works, proving ourselves and justifying ourselves, bringing people alongside of us that don't know what we know so we can be elevated in theology, bringing other people around us who are less righteous than we so we can look elevated in righteousness, bringing other people around us so that we can look, and all that is is self righteousness. Hardened heart, he says. But here you have the opportunity to partake of Christ. Well, his submission must be your submission. His sufferings must be your sufferings. His death must be your death. And the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead will raise you up too. The same Holy Spirit, resurrected body of Christ. And if his sacrifice, then you must sacrifice. That's why the Bible says in Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, you're a living sacrifice. Because just as he sacrificed, so must you sacrifice. The only offering that God finds acceptable is that which is coming from a sacrifice of who you, you give your will, you give your rule, you, you, give, your, you give a sacrifice of thanksgiving, you give a sacrifice, you, you give unto the Lord even when things look lousy and adversity is all around you, you have a joy in your heart. Where does that come from? You sacrifice, you're not complaining and murmuring and how come this, you're not doing this, and how come that's not coming out. Instead, you have no reason to be thankful. You're, you're full of thanks because your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And you come to a real full understanding that, wait a minute now, if I'm going to submit to God and all authority is His, if you, submit to His, if you submit as He submits, His authority is now your authority in the body of Christ. If you suffer as he suffered and you're in the fellowship of his sufferings, then he says that his glory is waiting for you. If you want to fellowship in his sufferings, then you will fellowship in his glory. That's what he says. You're partakers of Christ. You're partakers. If you partake of his sufferings, you partake of his glory that is coming, yet not yet. So that when he is revealed, you are revealed. When he gains full glory and is seen in his glory, you will receive and be seen in your glory. You will receive as he is because you are partakers of Christ. And he's promised this to you. Therefore, don't neglect so great a salvation. Don't let the deceitfulness of sin or unbelief, fleshly thinking, rob you, steal, deceive you away from what God has promised you. Hang on to the promise. Put your mind on it. Reflect on it. Think on it. Hang his truth, his promises in front of you. Live for it. And not only that, but exhort one another daily. Because you, if you just try to do it on your own, you're in trouble. That's why the fellowship comes together. And it says later on in Hebrews, do not forsake the fellowship of the saints. Don't forsake, because you, you need it. And others need you. But when you start pulling away and hiding away and, you know, while well, I watch sermons online and I just listen to it here and I just read my own and I can do it on my own. And you're already hardened and you don't even know it. What? Deceitfulness of sin has already got you comes to this place of understanding what he's saying here. 
is that if he's promised and says that you must have the fellowship of his death, then what has he promised? The fellowship of his life. If he's promised and says you must also be part of his sacrifice, then he's also promised his inheritance. That what he is inheriting is for you. Right now you're in the time, and I'm in the time, and we're in this trial era of submission, sufferings, death, and sacrifice. How's it going? You say, what's the church all about? Submission, sufferings, death, and sacrifice. You say, why do I want to come to your church? Can't I go to that church? Can't I go to where toys and videos? They just had video night at a church. Video night. I can't think. Uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. Family night. By, with Johnny Depp. Pirates of the Caribbean, full of ghosts and devils running around on, walking on water. Hey, there's only one who walked on water, and it wasn't that. You come to realize and you say that the deceitfulness of sin, submission, sufferings, death, sacrifice, I'm partaking of Christ. But wait a minute. The promises of God, the promise of God says His authority, His glory, His life, His inheritance. That's what's waiting for me. That's what he's promised. And the promises of God is what I'm living for. Hence, I'm a person of faith. Faith is living for the promise. What was promised is where I'm taking steps. I'm heading towards the inheritance. I'm heading towards the reward. I'm heading towards my life in Christ. I'm seated with him in heavenly places. He's, all authority has been given unto him. Nothing can come my way except by his say. And you start recognizing and saying, I'm walking instead for the glory of the living God. And I'm willing to sacrifice in the, in the flesh. I'm willing to suffer in the flesh. I'm willing to be rejected in this world because I'm accepted by the kingdom of the living God. I'm a partaker of Christ. You're a partaker of Christ. And you start recognizing, wait a minute, I'm not alone. And you have to sit at the lunch table by yourself. Oh my goodness. What possibly, what worse, well, how worse could it get? And you start recognizing, I'm not suffering at all. At work they won't talk to me. Oh my goodness. It's amazing what you have to put up with. We don't even understand it here in America. Coming to this place of recognizing, wait a minute, evangelists went into towns and walked out tarred and feathered. Men and women have killed and lost their children. And they would cry out to their children, remember who you belong to, do not deny the faith. As their children are being burned. We don't understand that. We get upset because our lunch money was taken. Coming to this place of recognizing that he's writing to a church, to the, to the church, and the Holy Spirit is telling them to no neglect. Put your eyes on the promise. Set your mind on things above. Don't get involved with. Can you imagine what it was when Ephesus, when Paul said he went in there in Ephesus and he fought the beast of Ephesus? He wasn't fighting just man, he was fighting the beast of Ephesus. The demonic controls that were going on in this great city called Ephesus. The beast of Ephesus. But those beasts were working through people. Men. Men with voices. Eyes that scorned. Scoffers. Mouths. Tongues. Hands that threw rocks. And he went in there and he says, I fought the beast of Ephesus. And he, and he won them over. And they came out and they burned what? All things contrary to the, to the Holy Spirit. They burned all their magic books. They burned all their sorcery stuff. They put a big pile. They burned, today, millions of dollars worth. Piled it and burned it. The whole city count burned it. I don't want nothing to do with this. And yet, in, F, in the book of Revelation, who does Jesus talk to? Ephesus. And says, you've lost your first love. I have this against you. The deceitfulness of sin. The deceitfulness of high-mindedness. High-mindedness like, no, we're doing well. And you start looking at all the areas that you're doing well. Because you refuse to look at the areas that you're not. You start priding yourself in what you're actually doing. No, I'm a good person. You're already in deceitfulness of sin. Because without Christ, you're not a good person. You have become good because He is good in you. And He has made you a good person. And you give all the credit, honor, and glory unto the Lord Jesus Christ. 
In Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14, Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14, not 314 but 214, he says, Inasmuch then as the children have, be, have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. See, Jesus came forth. And he partook of flesh and blood because it says, because the children, the brethren, the saints, those who belong to God, they have partaken of flesh and blood, meaning you and I, as the brethren, converted, consecrated saints of God. He's brought the church and he says, the church, those who belong to God, those who are born again and consecrated lives living for the Lord, he says, since they, since you, have partaken of flesh and blood, so he came and be partook of flesh and blood. But he hasn't left it there. But you also are partaking of his body, his life. You, he came and partook of where you're at, and now you're going to, by sacrificing and suffering in the flesh, as he did, you can now partake of his life, his inheritance, his heaven, his glory. It's a mutual partaking. He partook of your situation so that you can partake of his situation. Yes? He partook of your situation so that you can partake of his situation. You, he came and partook of your life, your monotonous, boring, suffering, sin-filled, wicked, ruled life. And he who knew no sin came and dwelt among us and partook of, think of the humility of Christ who put on a body, this body. You know what this body is. This body's filled with, with waste, phlegm, and with worms crawling through it. I've seen those films. <laughs> you say, this body. He subjected himself to the monotony of the day, waiting for time to unfold till the time came, people hating him. He partook of this. And he's calling for you to do the same thing. Why? So that you can partake of his life. But you must believe this. You must believe it. Not just saying, yeah, I know it's true. You must love the truth. Love the promise of God. That no matter what has taken place, I've decided to follow Jesus. I've decided to follow after him. I've decided to know him. I, well, I'm going to wait till I get older. You start right now. You don't wait for Juliana to, when she's 13, I'm going to start telling her about Jesus. You start singing her the songs right now. You bring her to Hebrews class tonight. Because you don't say, well, she's too young to know. No, she's got the Holy Spirit. And she'll pick up. You'll be amazed what God will do with a little child. You start learning right now. Learning discipline. Learning to listen. Learning to hear the Holy Spirit's words. I got pictures from some of the kids for past appreciation. Some of the kids, like Becker and Joellen and others have wrote me a hand, wrote me things, and drew pictures. Nolan did one with, and he, and he has me and Adam up here. And he has the pulpit, and he has the cross, he has the pig and the sheep, and he has the two monitors right above me here. And he's in there and preaching. And he gave me hair. <laughs> You're telling me he's not picking something up? You're telling me that it doesn't matter? Joellen gave a picture, just solid. And, and she drew everybody, no faces. And she drew me with hair, big smile. Caption coming out, to believe God. And she has all the people, and Kara's the one who spotted She goes, she has them all facing you. They're all the backs of their heads, facing. And I have feet this big. <laughs> Solid. Solid feet, planted. Coming to that understanding of what God is doing. It matters to hear, to know what's actually taking place. That you don't want to, you don't want to miss out on partakers of the holy promise of God. Partakers of Christ. Not just, well, when I'm, go I'm going to go to heaven. You've cut it short. You've cut it grossly short. You are partaking of Christ, meaning God Almighty Himself. Partakers, where the Bible says you will be just like Him. Who? The children of God. Who are the children of God? 
those who are born of his Holy Spirit, those who have loved as he has loved, those who carry out his word, those who are pursuing his promise, the Bible says that he knows those who are his. I don't know who those are his, but I have a good understanding by the fruit as to whether. Yes? Yes. The fruit is the... I can't just look in someone's soul and, yeah, oh, no, no, uh, yeah, you, no, you don't, you can't do that, but you see the fruit, the fruit of his presence, the fruit of repentance, the fruit of his love, the fruit of the spirit, you see the fruit of, you see it coming forth and you see a converted life, you see someone make it, what are we seeing here in our own body, the revival of consecration, I've decided turning from the old, turning from selfish ways, turning from our own affections, turning from our own emotional needs, turning instead to Christ you're my all in all, and you realize saying I'm partaking of him now. He's promised not just when I get there, but I can have his presence no. now. And I can have more of the more of the more. More of the more. I can have more of him. It's worth it, yes? Yes. That's why he says in 1 Peter chapter 5, 8 and 11. 1 Peter chapter 5, 8 to 11. He says, be sober and be vigilant. Notice 1 Peter 5, 8 through 11. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So what's he tell him to do? Resist him. Resist. Don't yield to him. Steadfast in the faith knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. The same what? Sufferings that the devil is assaulting, trying to bring people into subjection to him through the natural ways. But you don't yield to the natural, you don't yield to your own affections, you don't yield to his temptations, you don't yield to his, his assaults. Instead, you recognize that you're not the only one suffering, but all in the world the brethren are suffering, and you're in the brotherhood of the, of the saints. So it says, but may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while. What's it say? Why are churches not preaching this? It doesn't build a congregation, but it does build God's people. After you have suffered a while, you and I must suffer a while. Now, I, I'm not praying for you to suffer. I, I, hopefully, you're not praying that when I go to Africa, I hope, Lord, I hope that you just bring them through three weeks of suffering. I hope you're not praying to that end. I, you know, that, I hope that doesn't happen. I don't want it to happen to you, to me, but I also recognize that it must happen. It must. Why? Because that's where you have the opportunity to prove that you belong to Him. You have the opportunity to prove His long-suffering patience in your life. You have the opportunity to go after and persevere and plant your feet and stay steadfast in the faith. He says, after you've suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Oh, Lord, settle us. Yes? Settle us. Like, ah, come to that place where you're settled. To Him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, if you would, to the next second Peter. Go one letter over, chapter 1, verse 4. To what does he have waiting? An inheritance. Oh, excuse me, I'm in First Peter. Matter of fact, that's a good one too. So, yeah, we'll go there in a minute. It's a, By which we have been given us exceedingly great and precious promises. This is where the Word of God, faith in the Word of God, the promise of God, the Word, I give you my Word, I give you my promise. Verse 4, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. I want it. Lust. I want it. I want it. I need it. I've, I'm not complete without it. Lust is the evidence that you're not complete. 
Lust is the evidence that you're not complete. I need something to make me complete. I'm not complete. I'm not. I need that. 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 To satisfy, to fulfill, to complete me, I need that. I need her. I need him. I need that. Whatever it is, I lust for it. I'm not satisfied. I'm not complete till I have it in my life. It's the evidence of lust. Where the Holy Spirit becomes your all in all. Christ is enough for me. Christ is in, it's what we're talking about is completion, fulfillment, that I don't have a lust for the things of the soul, I don't need to, I gotta have this, I gotta have you, I gotta, I found my, my place in him and I've, how's it available? The, the divine nature, partakers of the divine nature, how? Through these great and precious, exceedingly great and precious promise, through these, I get the divine nature, faith, belief, that's what he's offering me. Coming to that place of understanding that those who are Christ have crucified their flesh with its passions and desires. Yes? yes? Those who belong to Christ. Galatians chapter 5 verse 24 says that. That those who belong to Christ. Galatians chapter 5 verse 24 says this. That those who belong to Christ. Those who belong to Christ. Those who are Christ. Those who are His. His people. What will be their trademark? What will we see in their life? They will crucify their passions, they'll crucify their, their desires, their affections, they'll mortify, they'll deny them. Now crucify is not, you're not going to put it up in your backyard, yes? You're not going to put one up in your yard and say, oh, I've got to go there today. The, the crucifixion is, I'm cutting it off. The crucifixion is the circumcision, I'm cutting it off. I don't want no part of it. I cut away. I don't look at it. You're like Joseph who ran away from sin. How can I sin against God and against man? Run. I cut off. I give it no place. I mortify these members as Paul wrote to the Romans. I mortify. I put to death. I give it no place. I use this instrument as an instrument of righteousness no longer for unrighteousness. I'm now satisfied with God. He's completing me. He's in me. He's impassioning me. And of course, you know, as I'm saying this, it's all quite easy, right? We just all just do this. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's just, it's a battle. And the Bible says in Galatians chapter 5 that it's a battle. He says, they war against each other. What's that sound like to you? A battle. It's a battle. He doesn't say in, all set, no problem. Just, all right, who wants the altar call? You walk out of here, ready for heaven. It's a battle. That's why he says, pick up your cross. Every day. Every day. Each and every day. Pick up your cross. Deny yourself. Follow him. Come into this place of recognizing that, saying no to yourself. Just saying no. People get caught up sometimes in these, in fast, and say, well, I'm going to, Fast this and fast that, and I'm going to go on a 40-day fast, a 30-day fast, a 10-day fast, a Daniel fast, a this a fast, a that a fast, and they go by what they're eating and not eating. That's not going to do it. Fast your own desires. That's what happens. Fast, fast your passions. Fast your desires. Fast your affections. Give it no place, because he'll fill you with his affections. He'll fill you with his desires. He'll fill you with a consecrated life. You become complete in him, and you walk in the Spirit as you never have before. You're partakers of the divine nature. In this you start putting off your old conduct and you start putting on his conduct. You take off your concerns and you put on his concerns. You no longer give place to your character. You now have his character. You no longer contend with your will. You now have his will. You no longer give place to your desires. You now have his desires. You've taken off the old man. You've put on the new man. You've taken off unrighteousness. You've put on righteousness. You now have his spirit. You now have his eyes to see. His heart to understand. His mind is renewed. And you start walking in the spirit. How much of your will, how, how much of your will does God want? Zero. Much problems that people have in church world today is they're still trying to get their will to surrender to God. They're trying to get their will to come into alignment with God. And it never works. All it does is create a stressful life. He wants your will to be dead. Gone. 
have no place. His will is now your will. I'm not trying to get my will to do his will. That's going to create a real problem in my life. Instead, you just die to your will. I don't have self-will. I have the will of the Spirit. So that you no longer boast in yourself, you now boast in God. You no longer are led by flesh or as a mere man. You're now led by the Holy Spirit. You no longer walk as a mere man on this earth. You now walk as the man and woman of God. You no longer are just having your mind. Don't even lean on your own thoughts. What's it say? Lean on His. Have His mind. Because you have His nature. But He says in Colossians chapter 2 verse 8, Beware lest anyone cheat you. Cheat you. In that same section of scripture, Colossians chapter 2, he says, Beware lest anyone cheat you, deceive you. Beware if anyone persuade you. Remember in Galatians, he says, Who has persuaded, he says, Who has bewitched you? And then says later on, he says, This persuasion is not from him who calls you. Persuasion, words, thoughts, beliefs. This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. And the Bible says in the Gospel of John, It's the Father that calls you. And that if you hear his voice, Father calls you. Who has bewitched you? This persuasion, chapter 5 of Galatians, this persuasion is not from him who calls you. This persuasion is bewitching you, turning you aside, turning on the gospel, making you think of yourself, and it's the deceitfulness of sin. And I've had people sit in my office even argue with me. Say, well, you know, don't you think? And they start twisting scripture to satisfy their own need. The high-mindedness kicks in because they want what they want. He says that we are his people, as we talked about this past, this past weekend. From Malachi chapter 3, verse 17 and 18, that we are his people. He says in Malachi chapter 3, 17 and 18, reading from there, they shall be mine, he said. This past Weekend we preached on Sunday, are you his? When he says in Malachi chapter 3 verse 17, they, they shall be mine, says the Lord. I, I relish in the thought and I'm humbled by the thought. Think of it now. I relish in the thought but I'm humbled by the thought that he calls me his. That should humble you. It shouldn't be a lifting of self up like, yeah, I'm chosen. It should humble you like, I know me. He calls me His. He calls me His own. Then why would I not want to respond with a desire to please Him? Faith. Why would I not want to pursue Him, the one who loves me and the only one who created all things, has a care and a concern for a guy, and this, this guy has a care and concern for you. He looks right past all the cantankerous, I mean, he looks past all the prime, prime ministers and presidents, all, the, all this and the that, and he comes to us and shows us what we were like, delivers us from who we were, and makes us into men and women like Moses and Jeremiah and Isaiah and David, who the Bible says in James, Eli was a man just like us. Yet he prayed, and God heard him. Who are we that God would hear us? But he says that we are his. Come into this place of recognizing, they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels. And I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then he says this, Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. Those who are Christ have crucified their flesh with its passions and desires. Those who are Christ. You belong to him, this should show up. The fruit of repentance. The desire to do good and to refuse evil. The, it, it, to, to, to discern rightly between what is godly and what is ungodly. To discern rightly and decide and to choose to stay away from evil, ungodly, unholy, unclean. To turn away from. And then what will happen when you turn away and say, unclean, I don't want anything to do with that. What will they say to you? Oh no, we understand. No, no, it's fine. Yeah, really? You have battles in your own homes that will stir up. You don't concede to and give place to and give regard to as to try to win over. No, as I said on Sunday, you don't drag that donkey into the barn. 
You move on with the sheep of God. You listen to the shepherd's voice. You move with what the shepherd is saying. You're empowered by him. So in this, you start recognizing what is God doing in your life. He's setting you free from this old corrupted world, from all its lies and its deceptions. He's setting you and I free to live a life in the Spirit. He's calling you to live the divine nature. Now moving on to verse 15. While it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. He says it again. If scripture, why in the same chapter does he say the same thing basically three times? Saying it, right? Do not harden your heart as in the rebellion. If you will hear his voice today. They always go astray in their hearts, saying it all through this entire chapter, saying it, saying it, saying it. In verse 10, they always go astray in their heart. Verse 9, they tested me, tried me, though they saw my works for 40 years. Verse 8, do not harden your hearts as in the day of trial. The Holy Spirit, verse 7, is the one who said that. The Holy Spirit was then saying it, and he's in the Holy Spirit now saying it. And he said in verse 11, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Verse 15, today, if you will hear his voice. Verse 13, today, don't harden your hearts through the deceitfulness of sin. Over and over, he keeps saying it. Why does he keep saying it? All right, I got it. Why does he keep saying it? The, the danger of it all. Think of the danger, the presence of it all. That's why he says, exhort one another. Come together, encourage, correct, admonish. Get yourselves in the truth, love the truth. Because the deceitfulness of sin lies at the door of every one of us. Well, except for me, you know I've been delivered from that. Seriously? Seriously. I got the same human issues that you got. It requires an everyday putting one foot and walking, 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 and then kneeling, 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 and then praising, 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 and then saying no, 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 no. My whole life is no. How about yours? Because I've got one yes. One yes that has made all the other no's come forth. No, I don't want that in my life. I, I've, I was telling Stephen the other day, I'll drive by McDonald's and I'll, I'll want to pick up a coffee for a buck. Now people will laugh at this. But I will say no, I can afford, I can, afford, I can go and buy a dollar coffee. But I'll tell myself, nope, not today. I'm just not going to give myself that pleasure. Nope. And I'll walk away. Nope. Not because, yeah, I, I can justify, have it, it's not, you probably say it's not a big issue. Nope, not today. And just say no to it. Why? Because I don't want it to rule or to give myself or the thought that I can't, well, I can have it. No, nope, not today. Can't wait till tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but you start denying. No, no. Because I've decided that my yes matters. How about yours? Yes. That your yes matters. That when I say yes, it matters. And when I say yes, kids, it matters. And when I say yes to the Lord, it matters. When I say yes to you, it matters. And when you say yes, say yes to humility, then you said no to every high-minded thing, every pride, not only in you, but everything around you. And you want to see people delivered from it. Not that they necessarily want that. But you want it for them. Love wants it for them. But you instead, you look and say, today, if you will hear my voice. What's the big word in that? Today. I think there's a bigger word. Yes. If. If. Meaning what? There's a, there's a choice here every day. If. Will you? If. Will you? Are you one of his? Are you one of his? Are you one of his? If you are, those who are Christ will crucify their flesh with its passions and desires. Today, if you will hear his voice, well, I don't know his voice, then that's the first place to begin. Because he is already revealed much. And all of this is a matter of learning his divine judgments and starting to see what holiness looks like and what unholy, what pleases God, what doesn't please God. What people, men of God and women of God, pursued decisions that they made. What's that all look like? 
What does humility look like? What does faith look like? And you start suddenly, you get on your knees, Lord, fill me with your love. How many times have you heard me say, Lord of glory, would you give me your love? Why do I keep praying that? Lord, give me your love for the kingdom. Give me your love for the word of God. Stir my heart. Help me, Lord, to rise up. Let me love God's people. Let me love the word of God. Let me, why do I keep her? Lord, give me a love for my wife. Give me a love for my children. Give me a love for my grandchildren. Why do I, why do I keep saying and praying the same thing? Because I know what I become without it. And I know what you become without it. I know what Juliana will become without it. I know what Hannah will be without it. I know what Matthew will be without it. And you know what it looks like when somebody leaves it. Yes? When somebody walks away from the love and the humility, you see what it looks like in someone's life. Cantankerous, self-willed, choosing their own ways, high-minded, and all of a sudden we become the enemy. The seriousness of it. He references it again and again because of the seriousness of it. This is serious business. We're partakers of the divine nature, and if we choose our own nature, human nature, that Christ said there's no good thing in it, then what did you just tell the divine nature? No. Nothing to do with you. I choose my own human nature, I choose my own affections, I choose my own desires, I do not want to suffer in the flesh, I'd rather you suffer instead. I crucify Christ so I can have my own way. Or I crucify my own way so I can have Christ. Choose this day. Partakers of the divine nature, the seriousness, do not harden your hearts. Don't neglect so great a salvation. Then he goes to verse 16. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? He references it again. The whole story of the unbelief. Again, I'm going to stress, unbelief, unbelief, unbelief. People have oftentimes in church world a misunderstanding of what unbelief looks like. Unbelief is not saying, I don't understand that this is so. They agree maybe this is the truth, that God Almighty is God Almighty, that He is the living God, but they twist His word and place theirs above His, and choose their own way and their own word in place of His. Unbelief. Yes? Here, indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt? How many? All. All led by Moses. Now, if they were led by Moses and they were unbelief and he left the carcasses in the wilderness, what will happen to the ones who are led by Christ or led by the Holy Spirit who refuse him? Think of it. Scary. Scary. And we can say, well, that's just church talk. That's just theology. That's just the Bible. You know, we, where is the coming? Where is the unbelief? Unbelief. Already present. You refuse to believe God so you can have your nice shoes. You refuse to believe God because you like the nice clothes. You refuse to believe God because you want to be called a certain title. You refuse to believe God because there's something in this world you want to be seen as success as a success in someone's eyes. And you love the affection of sin and you love the, the, the stirring of the, of the influence in your heart. You love the hormones moving in your life and you want something and there's lusting after something and you're not happy because Christ is not enough for you. There's something else you need to fulfill you. You lust for it. We all do. We have to battle that lust, that thing that we want, that someone that we want, that world that we want, that natural that we want. My wife and I, all through ministry, we've always called human nature basically by its acronym, HN. We'd always just say HN. Remember that? HN. Yeah, HN. Watch out. HN. 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 Watch out. HN. Human nature. It's detrimental, people. It's detrimental. Human nature, desperately wicked. Always lusting against the spirit, and the spirit is against the flesh. Galatians chapter 5 makes that clear. They were murmuring, murmuring, and they hardened their hearts. And he says they were all led out of Egypt. They were all experienced deliverance. They all saw the Red Sea. They all plundered Egypt. They all saw the, 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 the Red Sea split. They all walked around. They saw Pharaoh's army. And yet still, they spoke against Moses. They lifted their own word above the man of God. They lifted their own thoughts above God's thoughts. They lifted their own desires above the promises of God. They lifted their own 
desires, their own way, their own will. They high-minded replaces God's word, God's will, and it was Moses' mouth. They replaced Moses' mouth with their own. Let us choose leaders who can lead us back to Egypt. Let us get what we want. Let us go back to our security. Let us go back to our comfort. Let us go where at least we unbelief. Problem of self. I want it this way. The problem of self is to pre prefer self, to seek one's own desires. They did not believe because they did not listen. They refused to surrender. They placed their own word and their own ways above the voice of God, high-minded. They placed their own word and their own ways above the ways of God. Their own wisdom prevailed and not the wisdom of God. They replaced Moses, the man of God, his voice, his spirit, who they knew was the leader, who they saw the works of God, they saw the anointing, but they lifted themselves above him. He says, we choose, choose another leader instead. They heard, but they rebelled. Why? Because they had a big no in their heart. They had a big no sitting there. No. This is what I want. This is what I want. I know, Pastor, but this is what I want. I know. I've told some of you, this is what's going to happen. I've told people who have left there, this is what's going to happen. You do this, this is what's going to happen. And they do, and that's what happens. Coming to this place of recognizing high-mindedness is plaguing the church world. I'm going into Africa, and I'm dealing with high-mindedness. A spirituality that is spiritual, but no soundness. No maturity. They lack truth because they are so caught up in just the, 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 the ministry of decreeing and declaring. Decree and declare. Decree and declare. All about prophesy and prayer, but no obedience. No love, no humility. It's all about clothes, and it's about ties, and flowery things, and, and prayer, and decree, and declare this, and... just saw a video that a pastor in Africa, he's got a water bottle and he's pouring it on people's hands. Talking about the anointings being poured out on you. Pouring out. And he's pouring out water bottles. And as I'm pouring out the Holy Spirit on you, and he's pouring it out, and they're throwing money onto the, onto the platform. Trying to please God as he's got water bottles. Hey, anybody? Foolishness, foolishness. It gains nothing. What are they? It's all, if I give this, I get this. And it's all about trying to prosper in the natural. It's not of the Lord. They didn't listen. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 17. I know all of you are saying, how come we're going so fast? Huh? That's right. Yes. I can't believe it. We're, you know. Verse 17. Now with whom he was. Wait a minute, no, wait, that, that's, yeah, that's Old Testament God. He doesn't get angry anymore. You know, it's, it's, guys, yeah, that, that was a long time ago. He's changed. Christ has come. It's all good now. He's still angry with unbelief. There's still an anger that, that is saying no to unbelief. He says it right here. Now with whom he was angry 40 years, was it not with those who sinned? What's he call it? Sinned. What was their sin? Unbelief. What did it say earlier in verse 13? The deceitfulness of sin. What is sin? Unbelief. Anything that is not from faith is sin. Therefore we come and say, now with whom he was angry for 40 years, was it not with those who sinned? Well, what happened to these poor people? Whose corpses fell in the wilderness. Can't get any plainer than that. Right? 40 years, death march. What was 40 years? Death march. They marched around in the wilderness of unbelief, wandering about as 601,000 people dropped dead. Corpses. Just in case you want to do the math, that's 15,025 deaths per year. That's a lot of funerals. You think we've had funerals? 41 deaths a day. 41 every day for 40 years. How many? 41 deaths every day for 40 years. You don't even have time for it. You just left them. If the, if the ark is on the move, do you think they stopped? He let them lay in there for the carcass. They gave them no regard. No memorial, no funeral. 
leave unbelief, give it what it deserves, the disdain that it deserves. I want nothing to do with it. When the ark was on the move, the pillar was on the move, the pillar fire, the cloud by day, and it was on the move, do you think they stopped 41 times a day and had a funeral? And gave honor to the loved one? Well, it was our loved ones. Well, maybe he's in heaven. I hope he is. He led a good life. What did the Lord say? I left their carcasses in the wilderness. Their judgment was decided when they re refused to believe God. Just as the same anger is against anyone who is of unbelief, and the, he keeps saying it and saying it and saying it here in chapter 3, as well as in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, talking and he uses the same example of unbelief and what they were doing in the wilderness. Think of it. He says in Numbers chapter 14 verse 27, he says this. Numbers chapter 14 verse 27, he says this. How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? Complain. Mouth. Complaining is unbelief in action. Murmuring is unbelief in action. Complaining, murmuring, discontent. I'm not satisfied. I'm not complete. You're not enough for me. The promises of God are not enough for me. Faith is not enough for me. I want what I want and I want it now. I lust for this. I want this and you're not giving it to me. And we're holding him a hostage. We're placing our mind above his mind, our words above his words. We're replacing Moses' mouth with our own mouth and instead we're choosing our own way. And he says it is a complaining. Against me, I have heard the complaints with which the children of Israel make against me. He says in verse 29 of chapter 14, The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who were numbered, according to your entire number, from 20 years old and above. What do you think the 19-year-old is saying right now? It's like, oh. <laughs> Right? The 19-year-old, the 19-and-a-half-year-old right now going, oh. But now what's he got to do? Now what's he got to do? Right? He's got, wow. He better learn from that lesson. Yes? He better learn from that lesson. That 18-year-old, 19-year-old better learn from that lesson. That 16-year-old, that 5-year-old, that 6-year-old, that 2-year-old. Wow. If that's what happens to anybody 20 and above, that 20-year-old, he didn't have children yet. He's not even married yet. Why? He, he, just, he just listened to what they were saying. Exactly. He aligned himself with unbelief. So they all said, the Bible says. And in this, they were in unbelief. But now, what does the 18, the 17, the 16, the 19, the, what do they do? You'd better learn from this lesson. Because that same judgment is waiting upon all those who are still in unbelief. Unbelief. That's why he keeps saying, hear him. Hear him. Hear him. Well, hear him means what? I hear and obey. I follow after. I put my trust in. More than that, I love the Lord thy God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. I hear you. I hear you. You know, I've heard my kids raise the kids. I've heard, I know when they heard me and, yeah, I hear you. That's not what he's looking for, right? You don't want to hear, like, Dan, you don't want to hear, yeah, I hear you, right? Can you get the cordwood and you bring it in? Yeah, yeah, I hear you. That's not what you're looking for. Hearing means, I heard you, and not only go out and do it, but they love to do it for dad. They, stacking cordwood's not the best, right? <laughs> I understand that. But you do it as I can help. I can be part of, as unto. And so there's a love that I want to be a helper. I belong to this family. I belong to this. I'm a partaker of this. I'm a partaker of this family. Well, I'm a partaker of the divine nature. I'm a partaker of the kingdom. I'm a partaker of heaven. I'm a partaker of inheritance. I'm a partaker of his life. Then I'm going to. The sacrifice is nothing to be compared with what waits for me. Even the sufferings of this day can't, compare, can't be compared with what God has waiting for me. So you follow after. You, you don't want to be part of this unbelief. You learn from that example, just as I said, what does the 16, the 14, the 13, the 6 year old do. Well, what do we do? These examples were captured for you and I. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says that these were examples for us, the saints, the church. And that if they had to learn from it, then so you and I must learn from it, even more so because Christ has now come. So this should like stir you. 
it should convict you. It should also draw you. It should fuel you. And you should have a yes in you. And if you don't, and you're something you're just putting up with the service right now, there's a problem. If it's something like right now, boy, I wish you'd end. I really got to get to bed. There's, you, there's something problem there. I understand that. I really do. But instead, it should be, it's got to stir. Lord, I need this. I need to, I got to go, I got to get up tomorrow and I got to go after this. I got to go home tonight and I got to go, I'm going in with a new mind, a new heart. Stir my faith, oh God. Stir my love, oh God. Because how easy it can happen and we can slip away through neglect. And neglect so great a salvation. It says that he was angry, grieved, vexed. The word that it's using in chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 17, that he was angry for 40 years. The word for, for angry is to be grieved and to be burdened with and to be bothered with, and even more so, it says, to be disgusted with. Disgusted with. Ugh. Like, like feces. Disgusting. I'm not trying to be coarse. I'm trying to give an a picture. Feces. Ugh. Disgusted with. Oh, turn away from the smell of death, the smell of a dead body, all the chemicals breaking down. Oh, they're going oh. disgusted with, turn away from. He says it's a stench in his nostrils, and it should be with us too. The word for corpses, he left their corpses here in verse 17, he left their corpses, fell in the wilderness. The word for corpses is colon, colon, colon. It's the same word that's used for colonoscopy. Same word used for colonoscopy. The same root word. Dealing with the colon. That's how disgusted with. The lower end. That part. Left it there. Feces. Looking at verse 18. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 18. To whom... And to whom he did swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey. And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who would not obey, did not believe his word, did not obey his word, but instead chose their own words, chose human nature's words, chose their own will, their own way, their own words. I want it this way. I want what I want. This is what I want. I'm too afraid. I don't trust. This is what I'm going to do. And pursue and press. Pursue and press for their own way. Pursue and press for their own word. And build a support team. And so they all said. And they worked against and they worked up. And they pursued and they pressed for their own will in their own way. And he says, to whom did he swear that? To those who did not obey. The importance of obedience to the faith. Romans talks about obedience to the faith. Trusting his word, loving his word, following his word, knowing his will, knowing his ways. This is something we must do. This is something we must understand. This is something we must understand his love, his holiness, his humility. And is it in my heart? Where is it lacking? Oh God, help me. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, examine yourselves. Examine yourselves. Look. He says, many of you are sick and some of you have died because you did not discern the Lord's body. That's how important this is. Coming to see what's taken place. He says, you did not enter. They will not. You will not enter my rest. Think of it. You will not enter my rest. In the same way they couldn't come into the Garden of Eden and eat of the apple, uh, eat of the tree of life anymore. You will not. Cut off from it. He cut them off. You will not enter my rest. You will not enter my presence. You will not enter my peace. You will not enter my joy. Many people have made much of the Sabbath day in the sense of a day of the week. It's foolishness. As though God has taken the entire salvation plan and reduced it down to the turning of the sun around the earth around the sun. Ridiculous. The Sabbath rest is His presence. His perpetual presence. His personhood in your life. He comes into a place, God is spirit. He hasn't reduced it down to the natural turning of the earth around the sun, the orbits of the, of the moon and the stars. Instead, he's brought it down to this, his presence, the powerful presence of God, where you find your rest, your security, your safety, your provision, your peace, your joy, your contentment, your completion, your perfection. 
And you've come to this place where you've entered into his full presence. Where full confidence, you're no longer striving and struggling. But you've now entered into his, Christ is enough for me. And you realize the inheritance that God has. And he's already given you the down payment of the inheritance. His Holy Spirit. So don't deny the Holy Spirit. Don't choose your own ways, but choose His ways. Don't crucify Him, crucify you. Don't prefer yourself, prefer Him. Where is He? Christ in me, the hope of glory. I choose Christ. Choose my new life. Remember what I said on Sunday? To fight for your new life. Fight for your new life. Fight for your family. Fight for new life. Fight for holiness. Fight for humility. Fight for truth. Fight against that pride. Accept humility. Fight against that lie, that deception, that delusion. Choose truth. Fight against all things that are contrary and opposing Christ. Casting down arguments. I choose the simplicity of the gospel. The simplicity of the gospel. I was a sinner, now I'm saved. Christ in me, the hope of glory. So simple. I choose Christ. Come into this place of knowing who he is. Lastly, verse 19. So we see that they could not enter in because of what? Unbelief. What is unbelief? Choosing their own will, their own way, their own words. High-mindedness. Placing themselves above God's word, God's wisdom, God's ways. Remember all the W's. Who did not believe God, but had unbelief. Go back and read the story and see what they said and how they promoted and how they supported one another. Go look at unbelief at work. And he says they complained. Unbelief. They murmured. Unbelief. They chose captains for themselves. Unbelief. They refused to believe God. Unbelief. They did not obey his word. But wait a minute. Didn't they after go and obey God's word? Too late. That wasn't belief because God already told them this is what's going to happen to you. Then they didn't believe that. And they tried to work against the judgment and do it their own way again. He goes, I'm not in it. Again, they followed their own path, their own will, their own way. And he said, they could not enter his rest because of unbelief. They could not enter his presence. They could not have the promises of God. They did not partake of the promises of God. Why? Because of unbelief. How serious is this? What is he addressing? What is the writer of Hebrews addressing? A state of unbelief. And he's talking to who? The church. He's talking to the church people. He's not talking to the world. He's talking to the church. He's talking to the Hebrew church. He's talking to the Hebrews who have converted. And he's talking, he's writing to them. And he's saying, don't neglect this. Don't fall away. You're being persecuted by your own brethren. The Judaizers against you. The whole world's turned against you. But believe God. Trust in the promises of God. What he's got waiting for you. He's already given you the down payment. Believe God. Don't go into that same state of unbelief. Remember what happened? These were examples for you. Don't do that. Instead, put your mind on the things of God. Trust in the living God. Is there monotony of the day? Is there troubles in the day? Absolutely. The batteries break down and, and, and the heat goes off and the electricity goes out for three days and all kinds of things happen and people say this and write that and frustrated with this and they don't want to listen. They raise up their voices and kids fall apart and the school issues and absolutely. I, I probably named what? This much of the problems? They just Problems everywhere. If you, if you have no problems, just go look in the mirror. There's a whole host of them sitting right there. All right? And you just start looking and say, Lord, you've been good to me. You've saved my soul. You've given me understanding. Now, Lord, give me a love. Give me a humility. Give me a truth. Help me to be a person who believes God. I don't want to be unbelief. Look at what took place. He doesn't have to show it again. He's already given examples. And he keeps pointing to it. Just here, he points, points, points. 1 Corinthians 10 points again. Other places, he points to it again. All these things. You think he had 15,000 people a day dying as corpses in the wilderness? Do you think he did that and then hold us not accountable? After he's given us his Holy Spirit, and we say, well, at least he knows my heart. Yeah, he does. And he sees the unbelief. And he's calling for you to rise up, me, you, all of us, the church. Awaken, revival of consecration. I've decided to believe God in Jesus' name. Amen. And it comes to this place of recognizing, I want to enter his rest. That's what chapter 4 now goes into. When we go into it next month, in December or January or when we pick this up again, we go into chapter 4. He starts talking about the rest that is in Christ Jesus. The rest that is available. It's not available to those of unbelief, but it is available. There was a rest that was promised that was not given. So the rest still remains. 
The rest still remains to be gained. It's still there, waiting to be gained. How can we gain it? By believing God. The rest, the presence of God. Who is it for? Those who are His, in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise God. This time tomorrow night, the flight leaves at 827. So right about this time tonight. Tomorrow night, excuse me. Be on a plane going to Kenya and work through and all the things that are declared here, going to declare there. Calm down, smarten up, wake up, let's go. Right? <laughs> so short sermons, right? Short bullet point sermons. Praise the Lord. Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace and your goodness and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you have brought forth a people and are bringing forth a people. Even now, Lord, so personal, we are some of those. We are those people. You are calling us to the divine nature. What a privilege, what an opportunity, what a right, what a responsibility. And yet, you said we have the right to be called children of God. Why? Because we are. We're born of your holy seed. And I pray, Lord God, that we would preserve it. And we would yield to your Holy Spirit. And we would say yes to your spirit, to the divine nature, recognizing that any suffering and any sacrifice is not worthy to be compared to the promises. We're not worthy to be compared for the inheritance. Not worthy to be compared to the life that you have waiting for those who love God. I pray that we would be that church that loves God. That we would be that church, our families, our children, our grandchildren. I pray, Lord, for our grandchildren, grandchildren, that we would be a perpetual generation, that there's a people of God that have been established here to live for you, a people that believe God that it would start right here with our youngest Juliana and all those who will come after her that even her children and her grandchildren will be people who believe God I pray it in Jesus name I pray that Merrimack Valley Church will always be known as a place where your light your life and your love is seen and it goes out into all the world that people would know that this is a church people who love God love the truth live for the truth and we want the rest that is available in Christ Jesus that we would be excited about the promises of God and never give ourselves Lord to the weaknesses of this world and never give ourselves to the affections of our own heart that we would never operate with a high mindedness rebuke us any one of us that are in high minded bring us to a state of humility that we would choose Christ yes. oh Lord of glory I pray for your blessing in Jesus name amen amen, amen. praise God